So today I'm going to kind of talk to you a little bit differently than how Plasma is constructed or how you build Plasma, but I want to actually talk about applications that we're building and deploying into production with Plasma and how Plasma is actually going to scale games on the blockchain. And I'm kind of a big fan of games because I think it's actually what's going to drive normal user adoption onto the blockchain. So like we're super passionate, even though we're like researching Plasma, we're always kind of passionate about how can we actually get end users to play and use the blockchain, right? Cool, so this talk actually starts about 20 years ago. So I used, to, I used to play this game called Magic the Gathering. Anybody here actually play like Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh or, all right! <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people in a nerdy crowd, so it wasn't a big surprise. Um, so we used to like, when we were in high school, we used to play Magic the Gathering, we used to play card games and Yu-Gi-Oh and all this stuff, and we, were, we loved it, right? And, you know, about a year ago when we were starting a blockchain company, we said, you know what, it would be really amazing if we put Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone on the blockchain because you could have real ownership of cards, you could have provably correct uh, logic, you know, you could actually prevent fraud, you could actually have real money embedding inside the games. We said, let's do it. So I don't know if you guys were developing Ethereum about a year ago, but having a full card game on the blockchain was just not reasonable, right? And that's where we've kind of taken this journey over the last year about trying to take a very simple application and actually scale it and run it on top of the blockchain. So cool, so you, you're, you're looking at me, you're like, Matt, I play Fortnite, I play all these games, why do I need it on the blockchain? That doesn't make any sense. The blockchain is for transferring value. It's for, you know, running prediction markets and stuff like this. It's not for games. So I actually, I actually think that games are, have some really amazing use cases that actually blow away traditional games. So obviously everybody talks about real ownership of assets, right? Like the items that you in, own in game, you can really own them, you can trade them, you know there's digital scarcity. If you guys have ever played like an online game, like an MMO or any other kind of game, you know that the, the publisher will just flood new items continually. And if you had some valuable staff of magic, it will like over time lose its value. But it's kind of nice that we can actually know what the value of our items are because we actually know what the scarcity of our items. What's also kind of cool is Vitalik actually had this quote where like, like, he was really sad when they changed the rules of StarCraft, and he stopped playing, because the one day they, like, changed how the game worked. And I think what's kind of cool is if a game runs on the blockchain, we can just literally fork it. If we think that, like, we want to play Ultima Online with Dreadlords, or we want to play the original World of Warcraft before they nerfed it, we can just literally fork the blockchain and be able to run our version of the game, right? And then the last point, we just made this realization very recently. And I think that this is going to be like one of the biggest features is because we have a trustable VM, because we have this, the EVM and it's trustable, we could actually have end users upload code into our game servers. And now we could have anybody that plays our game could make mods for the game. And the mods are, un, are not cheatable. They could actually be running on the chain and other people could be introspecting the mods. So, we think that there's a ton of amazing use cases for actually wanting to run these games on the blockchain. And now you can actually monetize it. So like you could actually build a game, we could actually build like game modes and actually be able to charge users for them. So gaming on the blockchain has actually been around for quite a long time. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen, Bitcoin actually had the first blockchain games. So about five years ago, there was this group called XCP and they actually built blockchain games, and, but they had like custom miners, and then they would put little bits of metadata on top of, the, of, on top of the Bitcoin chain. So it was kind of the first start, and basically the only thing they had was asset ownership. You could prove that you owned some asset, and the asset had scarcity. And then Ethereum came out, right? And obviously we all know last year, last year was when the big jump happened. When CryptoKitties came out, everybody said, oh my God, Ethereum actually runs a pretty cool application. And these ERC-721s came out, and everybody was jumping all over it, right? But it was kind of boring, right? So anybody here ever play CryptoKitties? 
okay, like half the audience. It was kind of just a Ponzi scheme with like a cute graphic scheme. So don't, don't get me wrong, I have a couple cats. I, I, I'm, I'm a fan. But it was kind of like, okay, this is cool, but like this isn't anything that like mainstream gamers are going to care about. This isn't going to come in. I'm not going to get my electronic gaming monthly and see Crypto Kitties in it, right? It's kind of still a very boring game. But it did invent the concept of these non-fungible tokens, right? So now we have like the first kind of building block for all of this gaming technology, right? And obviously we all know like proof of work chains like Bitcoin and Ethereum have been really secure. And they've been, they, but the thing is is that they're still quite slow. So we're never gonna actually be able to run a full game on a proof of work chain. At least I don't think we will. So I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna see a combination of other kind of consensus mechanisms joined with Plasma, and Plasma will be adding the security from the, from, from the proof of work chain, and then you're gonna have side chains that are running on DPoS or proof of stake or maybe other consensus algorithms as they come out. So we're currently a really big fan of DPoS. Uh, because you can actually deploy applications today. So if you look at a couple of popular chains like Steemit and EOS and then Loom and a few others, they're all, a lot of them are kind of going with this DPoS model. And it's, it's, it's a lot more centralized and it's good for applications that have lower value, like games. I wouldn't want to run my core blockchain on DPoS. I wouldn't want to run like the blockchain that holds all of the value on a DPoS chain, but you can be able to run pretty interesting blockchain applications on top of DPoS. Um, so we're big fans of sidechains. So these guys earlier have been talking about Plasma and using Plasma for payments and that there are Plasma chains. So there's kind of really three scaling techniques right now that we're talking about with blockchain apps. We have the state channels, we have Plasma and sidechains. And I kind of think that it's going to be a combination. I don't think that you're going to see, there's some groups that say, oh, we're, you know, you can run everything on Plasma. I don't believe that's true. You can run everything on a side chain. Sure, you could do that, but then you don't have as much security. So I think really combining the Plasma with the side chains is actually what's going to be, what's actually making these applications run. So that was kind of a very, very long-winded way of being able to show that we can actually have real card games. So this is a game called Zombie Battleground, where it's actually like if you guys play Hearthstone or, or Magic the Gathering, it's a real card game that runs on a sidechain. And what's really cool is because we have it running on a blockchain, like I was saying earlier, now we have end users can upload new game modes. So a user could say, I want to write a solidity contract that gives me a tournament. And the tournament says, oh, everybody has to put in a half an ETH, and whoever wins the game gets all the ETH, right? And the owner of the contract could actually monetize the contract, and they could be reusing all my game assets, my client, my chain, and they would be able to extend the functionality to their end users without having to build a full game themselves. And we think that, like, by having lots and lots of developers be able to extend other games, this is also gonna cause decentralization to the games themselves. So, so you're saying, Matt, you know, this is a Plasma talk, when are we gonna get into Plasma? I said, yeah, so, so one of the issues we had was originally when we started this game, we had a bunch of people back the game. And we had like 2,000 users kind of donate to, to fund the game. And initially, we had to give them two million cards. So I don't know if you know how much time it would take to give two million cards across the Ethereum blockchain. We would have probably eaten up every single transaction for like over a week, if not two weeks, on the entire chain if we were gonna do this. So obviously, it wasn't even feasible on day one, and this was only with two users, with 2,000 users, right? So that's when, we, that's when we started to say, and these, these are what the cards look like, by the way, just so you have kind of a good reference. So we were like, okay, how can we give them these assets, right? And how can we secure them? So first, we wanna be able to issue assets on side chains. So that way, like, we can have, we can even have on-ramps from, like, mobile games. So, like, let's say that, you know, you have free-to-play mobile games, you wanna on-ramp these users, right? And maybe a few hours in, then you wanna tell them about crypto. 
you want to start with having them play these games and then eventually get in and say, oh, this, you mean I can move my assets to Ethereum? You mean that I can sell my assets for Ether? Or I can sell my assets for Bitcoin or something like this? And then we slowly get adoption through these people that are just kind of playing these games. And they don't even really realize that they're doing the blockchain. And then one day we get like, we just on-ramp them, right? And this is where kind of Plasma comes in. Because Plasma is going to be the mechanism that we're going to actually be able to exchange these assets to mainnet. So before we get into Plasma, just like a quick 30 seconds about me. Uh, I'm the founder of Loom Network. We build L2 solutions. Uh, we also build games. Uh, I'm a big Go developer, so if anybody here likes to talk about Go, I love to geek out about it. And fun fact, I rode a well elephant to my wedding. And if you get me drunk, I will speak Thai to you. So that is it. So what was Plaza? So about a year ago, when I first heard about Plasma, uh, Vitalik had written the white paper. And I read the original white paper, and I was like, wow, this is magical. It's like unicorns and sunshine and all this stuff. And I said, this is just not possible. I said, when, I, when you read the original paper, it's just it's too kind of out there. It's like 10 years in the future kind of thing. And I, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to do plasma. I don't believe it's going to exist. I want to build my apps now, right? Um, so, so now plasma has actually changed. And I think every speaker has said this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal their lines, is that Plasma Cash is now Plasma. Basically, anybody that's... <laughs> somebody was going to, like, hoot over there or something like that. But basically, anybody that's talking about Plasma or the original Plasma paper has just totally missed the last six months. Because basically, everything is moving to Plasma Cash. Plasma Cash is a massive simplification of all the Plasma constructions so that we can actually use them in real applications today. We even have an open source repo right now where you can go and download and use Plasma on our test net for free right now. So, so it was funny, so like about five or six months ago, I'm on Reddit and some guy is like trolling me on Reddit. This V Butering guy, I don't know who that is. And he's like, you guys should really like, you guys should like really do plasma. And I said, I don't know. And he's like, oh, I'll hook you up with the Amise Go guys. So he hooked me up with David over here. And we had some coffee in Bangkok. And he's like, man, plasma cash is the future. And after like 30 minutes, I was convinced that it was the future. So about six months ago, we started actually building the first real plasma cash implementation. Because I knew that it was actually something that could go into production and be actually be used this year, because that's what I care about. You know, it's fun to talk about this stuff in the future, and I know a lot of you guys are building the next generations of this stuff, but I kind of, I kind of just want to ship my game. Like, that's, that's just kind of my main motivation here, and that, that's kind of what I'm trying to get out of this talk, is that, you know, a lot of these guys are talking about the research, but I really just want to build some stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of a different category. So just a quick background about us. So we built L2 solutions with D DPoS and Plasma Cache. There's a bunch of people that are doing it. I'm a big fan of Plasma Cache. You don't have to use us. Amisa Go is doing some amazing work on the Plasma Cache stuff also. Woo! Somebody was jumping in there. Um, so you're like, OK, cool. You've kind of told me, you give me some background about why Plasma, why DPoS, how are these things kind of coming together, and how are they actually useful today? How does this all fit in? What, what does this actually technically look like when we look at like a diagram, right? So this is like a kind of a big jumbled diagram that I stole from somebody else. But basically the idea is, is that you have a proof of stake network, whether it's DPoS, a proof of stake, or in some cases the proof of authority network that is, is allowing users to be able to do tr plasma transactions between themselves on this side chain almost immediately. So a lot of these chains have sub-second commit times. So then if, as long as we have these plasma cache, we can actually transfer or trade value between every single person that's on that side chain. And if at any point in time we don't trust that side chain, we can pull our assets back to Ethereum, and we don't have to trust the constructions of the side chain. 
What's kind of cool is basically what's happening is that side chain is periodically just compressing all that information and dropping Merkle trees onto a smart contract on mainnet. And the clients can verify it. And there can even be third party people that can verify it and slash this contract. So if the, if the side chain ever tried to, to cheat you of value, there are other people that could actually work on your behalf and, and actually penalize the side chain. So I'm going to skip this. So I kind of want to show like what it looks like when you're doing a plasma trans transaction. So it's not going to be particularly different. So like let's say that we have a mobile app that's like a marketplace, right? And we're going to buy like a specific item. Like we could actually go into the marketplace and we could pick an item and then what's going to happen is on mobile it would link to your wallet. So it would link to your Ethereum wallet. You see it, it's, it's not obvious, but that's actually Trust Wallet. That's not our app when you switch. So Trust Wallet and a couple other wallets, they actually allow deep linking. So if you have a mobile app, like a mobile game, you could link into it. The user doesn't really feel like they're having to go to their wallet interface. They can sign the transaction, and the information signed from the transaction just jumps back into your application. So we can actually make these seamless user experiences even when we're doing complex things like Plasma. And to me, like, that's actually the exciting stuff. I'm sure the Merkle trees and the sparse Merkle roots and all this stuff, that's super awesome. But like, if an end user can use this and barely even know that they're using crypto, that's even more exciting to me. Yeah, so just so you can see, so this screen is actually your wallet. And it's just deep linked into your wallet software. So George touched on this a bit too. And I'm going to talk about this for just a minute, is these things called liquidity providers and why they're important. So one of the things that both David and Calvin and, and uh, George were talking about is that there's these long exit periods. There can be a one-week, two-week exit period for a plasma chain. So for a normal user, that's really kind of really annoying. Like, I deposit ETH into this chain, and then before I get my ETH back, I have to wait like two weeks. Like when we use Binance and they make us wait two minutes after we log in, we're already annoyed enough to get our ETH back. So what we can do is like chains like Loom can actually operate things called liquidity providers where they're watching all the transactions and they can see that, hey, these transactions are actually valid and I'm going to credit the user for the transaction in advance and then I'll take the payment a week later. So we can take the spread and, and, and allow the user to exit very quickly because we're watching the chain and we know that these transactions are valid and that nobody else is going to be able to contest them. So we can take that, and that's another mechanism that we can use to like smooth down the user interface and make it even easier for people to build these Plasma applications. So just kind of getting started, I, I know there was somebody in the crowd that was like asking about how to get started. Um, so, anybody here ever use crypto zombies? Okay, cool. Like a like a good half of the audience. So we actually just started crypto zombies season two today. Um, so we have a whole bunch of stuff about these custom game modes, uh, but we're actually coming out with a plasma cash lesson over the next two weeks. So basically, what we want to do is we want to make it plasma cash as easy to use as a person learning Solidity for the first time. So if there's things you guys want to see in the upcoming lessons, go ahead and hit me up because. We love to get some feedback, but we really just, we think that education for developers is kind of the next step. So if we have 1,000 developers that know how to use Plasma, then we're going to have 10,000 Plasma applications, and it's just going to snowball on itself. And I want to kind of come back here next DEF CON, and I want to see PLAPS, or what was it? <laughs> PLAPS. Woo! I want to see some PLAPS next year, and uh, then, I'm, then I know that like, we actually did a very good job. Cool. So uh, George mentioned very briefly, uh, our Plasma Cache implementation is open source. Uh, the Omise Go Plasma imp implementation is open source also. We also have a tool called the Plasma CLI that allows you to just have a REPL and be able to toy around with Plasma transactions because we got to the point where we were like trying to do these things and it was really confusing and we just built a very simple REPL on how to use Plasma so that way you can like walk through transactions, you can, you can test invariants, you could test like if you have a failure condition. So that way you can kind of actually know how the transaction flow is going to work and if you're going to cancel things, you can actually know how to cancel them. 
So cool, cool things to build. Um, this wouldn't be a good talk if I didn't give you some suggestions. Uh, liquidity networks, I think, are really cool. So like if you have big t pools of tokens and you want to transfer them, like say that you have ETH and Bitcoin and Omisigo and Loom tokens and you want to be able to have pools where you automatically convert it, like that would be a great use case for Plasma. Um, I've seen DEXs. Uh, I'm obviously a big fan of gaming. And something that not a lot of people are talking about is you could potentially be using Plasma as a cross-chain communication. So let's imagine that we have three or four different chains that are communicating with each other. They could actually communicate with each other without going to Ethereum mainnet. They could actually use pa Plasma Cast constructions between the different chains just to communicate. So takeaways. Um, so Plasma Cast is here. You can use it today. If you have questions, you can ask the four of us down here in the front. Uh, you can use it for non-fungible tokens, to, uh, and you can scale payment networks with it. Um, so I have a few minutes, and I want to an answer questions. So we'll open it up for questions. Cool. I think this gentleman in the back was the first one. You can just shout it out, and I'll repeat it. Yeah, so that was a great question. The question was, you can't run an EVM on, a plas on Plasma, so how do you run the game logic? So that's, that's where like, we think that different consensus models are interesting. So we have a side chain that runs DPoS. So the game logic actually runs on contracts on the DPoS chain, and the DPoS chain has a lot higher transaction rate. When users want to do things of value, they can use Plasma as the mechanism of transference of value between chains. And that's where we think there's a kind of be a balance over time until some kind of mechanism comes that we can actually do uh, EVM on Plasma. Cool. This gentleman? That's a great question. So Trust Wallet, does it support Plasma? It doesn't need to. So it's just an Ethereum wallet that allows deep linking by other applications. So I believe some of the other wallets do, but we're friends with the Trust Wallet guy. So basically, all you're doing is you're sending a, an Ethereum transaction to the wallet, just like you would MetaMask. And probably the new MetaMask wallet will probably just work also. You're just sending a transaction. It doesn't need to know about it. And the user approves the transaction in the other wallet. Yeah, I th so that was a good question. What is our biggest challenge this far, and what, what's kind of going forward is our biggest challenge? I think our biggest challenge has always been trying to figure out how we can actually get normal users to get onto these applications, and how do we get adoption? So like everybody else is kind of talking about the technology, and I have lots of people that work for me that look at the technology, but I'm really excited about how many users are using it, how easy is it for me to onboard a user, and how, many, and how much can we grow crypto? Because if I can grow crypto by 10 or 20,000 users, I've made a, quite a large dent, right? And if a couple other developers do this, all of a sudden we have like a very large community of people that are actually using crypto. Um, kind of going forward, I think the biggest things are going to be about UX and UI. Uh, these Plasma, if you've played with Plasma transactions, they're still very complicated. There's, you know, there's deposits and withdrawals and challenges and then mass exits and all these things. And I think that there's going to be a ton of work involved in trying to figure out how we explain these to the user or how we hide these away from the user without them losing all of their security. That, that's really what I think is kind of the challenge going forward. Um, I'm gonna, I'll go back to you, but this gentleman in the way back there. This is a great question. So he was saying that if you have 2 million tokens in a plasma cache, that over a year you could potentially have a petabyte of storage. I, I, I don't know if that's the exact number, but 
basically, so a couple of the, uh, I think George was talking about Plasma XT. There's a couple, uh, there's a couple proposals for checkpointing. So essentially what's gonna happen is that you're not gonna be tracking two million assets over that time, or if you are, we're gonna have smaller and smaller checkpoints because obviously holding around a petabyte of data is not something that's reasonable. Zero, or zero knowledge proofs. Yeah, that was a good question. So can we upgrade our plasma chain? Yeah, so like basically with any blockchain, you can upgrade it through either soft or hard forks, depending on if the validators of the network accept the changes. Uh, so we have smart contracts on our plasma chain that are upgradable also. So yeah, there's, there's no reason why you can't upgrade the plasma chain over time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, this guy in the back here. Uh, how big of a team do we have to build it? Um, so Loom is 70 people. Uh, the team that built the game is around 30 people. So, so quite a sizable team. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So this is a great question. It says, while you're in the game, the game is actually controlling the key. Uh, could the users potentially be controlling that key? So we, we, perfectly, we, we purposely try to do this thing where we have multiple keys. So we have a private key that is actually doing your gameplay that has no real value other than the action. So if that key is lost, the only thing the person can do is just kind of play the game as though they're like you. And that we purposely make any of the keys for values, the ownership of the items, to be a different key that's controlled by your wallet. So that way, when you're actually doing actions that would move or sell or buy items, you would use, you would use your primary wallet. Right, yeah, exactly. Both keys are on your computer. Yes. Yep, that's correct. So, so the question is, Zombie Battleground is a, is a game that runs on Loom, and does it use Ethereum for asset management? So the chain itself has asset management, and when you want to move, at, but you can move assets back to Ethereum. So the idea is, is that there's going to be lots of these side chains, and then over time, if you want to move value back to mainnet, so like say there's a DEX on mainnet that you wanted to use, you can move the cards back to mainnet and trade it. Or if you just wanted to store it on your ledger or, your, or some other hardware wallet, you can move it back to Ethereum for that. So what the question was, how else does the game use it? So, uh, uh, so on the side chain, we use, we obviously we put the assets, we have the game logic, and then we allow end users to upload new solidity contracts to modify how the games work on the chain. I think I have time for maybe one more question. Uh, this gentleman in the way, way back here. How have we been marketing the game? And I have gotten so much grief from the entire crypto community about this. So we did a Kickstarter, not for money, but because we wanted to get a whole bunch of gamers, a bunch of people that don't know anything about crypto. And basically all of our marketing efforts have been about the game, about how, how fun the game is. And we have purposely not done crypto people because if I have a thousand p crypto people that just want to get in another Ponzi scheme of buying cards for me, that's not exciting to me. But if I get 10,000 users of people that like think my game is awesome and fun, and then they eventually find Ethereum, then I have won. So that's it. Thank you, guys.